Hey guys, Joe here, back to the word today with an exciting video on this book right here, Getting Started in Systematic Theology, What, Why, and Who to Know, A Reformed Primer to Systematic Theology. Long title there, but I'm really excited about the content of this video. This content is really based on this work right here, Getting Started, An Introduction to Systematic Theology for Students and Laymen, just published by R.J. Gore or Dr. R.J. Gore and the Greater Heritage Christian Publishing. This book was sent to me in exchange for an honest review, but I know from knew from the moment I picked it up, I was going to love this book, the contents, learning more about it. It's not just for student and layman. It's for anyone who wants to know about the foundation, some of the history of for the Reformed theological way of doing systematic theology, and I know you will enjoy this book. As we get started, I've timestamped this video because I know it's going to be a bit longer. So the sections of this video are going to be a little bit about the history of Princeton Theological Seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary, and Presbyterianism in the United States as a whole. Then I'm going to jump into major theologians you should know about as you're reading this work. That was one of the values for me coming from a Baptist background or confessionally Baptist background. I dealings with Presbyterianism in different ways, shapes and forms, the Gospel Coalition, Together for the Gospel, listen to Westminster Theological Seminary books, podcasts, different things. And so I learned a lot from this book. And so I want to share with you some of the major theologians you should know about as you enter and read this book, or if you decide not to read this book, you should still know about. And so then we're going to move into the final section, which is kind of an overview of this content of this book. I'm going to have my notes right up here. As I go through works like this, I like to take notes. It helps me learn, but it also allows me to share with you guys some of the things I thought were important and kind of give you a tease of what you're going to get if you buy this book and read it. I would encourage you to buy this book and read it. This is something I am really glad I'm going to have on the shelf. I'm going to pull it off for years to come, and so I'm really excited about its content and to share it with all of you. So with that being said, as we get started, like, subscribe, if this has helped you. If you have questions, I'd love to hear them about them in the comments. Maybe you have a favorite systematic theology book. I'd love to hear about that as well. I've done a short review of this work already, just straight to the focus, to the points. You can find the link to that video in the description below of this video. I also have a link to my written blog where I've done a review of this work as well, and that link is in the description below as well. So with that being said, let's get into this video right here and the contents that I shared with you guys. First up, kind of the history you need to know about. So Dr. R.J. Gore comes from the Presbyterian background. So for those who are not aware, Presbyterianism, and it's going to talk, this book is going to walk through the history kind of development of doing theology as Presbyterians or for the Reformed Systematic Theologian is what he likes to call it. So necessary to kind of understand some of this book, and you'll pick it up from this book, but just me giving it to you right here, is you kind of need to know that Old Princeton or Princeton Theological Seminary was founded about 1812. I think John Witherspoon was one of those that was used in the formation of it and other things. And so it was this bastille for Presbyterianism, for belief, for Reformed theology, until its reorganization in 1929. Some of the liberal theology had crept in, disbelief in the Bible, and other things. And so they kind of reorganized and pushed those who were solid believing, or Bible believing Presbyterians out of the uh, the seminary, or at least that's how I understand it from the history I've got here. Forgive me if I have little things wrong, but that's what happened. And so J. Gresham Machen started Westminster Theological Seminary. And so he started pulling some of these great theologians um, to teach for him. So you have, um, so uh, you think J. Gresham Machen, so he pulls in John Murray, he pulls in Cornelius Van Til, he pulls in others to teach. And so they kind of corrected some of the ways Princeton had gone wrong and formed some of the ways that we do systematic theology today. One of the important ones we'll know about, I'm going to talk to him here in a second, is Charles Hodge, who was part of Princeton Theological Seminary, who wrote a whole book on systematic theology. So then Westminster starts stewarding that, 
refining that, talking about that. And so you're going to get a lot of that in here from this book. So moving into the second part of this video, major theologians mentioned in this work, you can see the name index, the back of this book for the complete list. I'm just going to tell you, um, these are just the big ones that kind of fit in that Presbyterian era that you need to know about. Dr. Gore is well researched in this book. Um, he is far read, read. He does good research. Um, these are not the only guys mentioned, but these are some of the major ones that you should know about and some of their positions within and disciplines that they taught. So first up, we have B.B. Warfield or Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. He's a Presbyterian professor of theology at Old Princeton. He first shows up on page two. I have page numbers for each one of these guys for when they first show up or when the biggest major treatment of them is, but they show up throughout the book in various points. So look at the index in this book when you get it and read it for the full place of everywhere he shows up. He's over everywhere a lot. Um, so Cornelius Van Til is a Presbyterian uh, reformed apologist, taught at Princeton, then professor of apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary. He's known for epistemology. So how do we know what we know? Study of knowledge, source of knowledge. He's the father of presuppositional apologetics. There's some pages on more of his treatment. Gerhardus Voss is Presbyterian. He was the pioneer of biblical theology, and he taught at Princeton Theological Seminary. And there's some pages on him. J. Gresham Machen, he's Presbyterian, founder of Westminster Theological Seminary, and there's the page numbers for him, and just the biggest treatment of him, obviously throughout the book in multiple places as well. John Murray, Presbyterian, taught at Princeton Theological Seminary, and then helped found Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, seminary with Machen. So page 22 and some others there as well. Charles Hodge, Presbyterian professor of theology at Princeton, wrote a book on systematic theology. Page 67 is the longest treatment for him. The big thing you need to know is we're talking bare bones, getting started, foundational, how to do systematic theology in this book. This book is not just about the disciplines, say like it's, it's not an overview of the disciplines. You're not going to get this book and get a slim down version of what theology proper is in the study of God and his attributes or pneumatology, the study of the spirit or homardiology, the study of sin or ecclesiology, the study of the church. This is about the undergirding system of how doing systematic theology well came about and a summary of that and getting started in doing systematic theology, not in the actual disciplines and categories, although it's going to lead you straight into the study of those things. So Charles Hodge is really important because he wrote um, the big book on systematic theology that they talk about uh, somewhat and on that topic specifically. And so he shows up at page 67 where uh, Dr. Gore actually talks about a proposed model for doing systematic theology or reformed model for doing systematic theology. And he actually shares Hodge's model for doing it. And then he uses actually J.I. Packer to critique some of Hodge's weaknesses and some of the ways that they've um, improved on those things. But that for when we get to the content below later in this video. Uh, other notable theologians mentioned in this work but not treated as extensively. They show up in different ways. Um, Wayne Grudem, Calvinistic Baptist, page 7, he shows up other places as well. John Frame, Presbyterian, shows up multiple places. John Calvin is all, all over the place in different respects, in different ways. Donald Blosage is in different places. I don't know that I'm saying that right, forgive me, but United Church of Christ, he shows up for different reasons. And then J.I. Packer as an Anglican, but in the Reformed tradition side of things, uh, page 84, he is actually critiques of Hodge in different ways are shared. We'll get to those later in the video. Now on to section three, why most of you clicked on here, a primer for doing systematic theology um, in the Reformed manner. Um, Let's get into the content of this actual book. My notes are on the screen for you guys. Honestly, I'm not going to hit everything I wrote down. And you need to get this book to get everything. He does such a great job. But I want to put them up and uh, so you can pause the video if you want to read some more in depth. And I'm going to give a flyover of the notes I made so that in the future I could search it and find it because I knew this content was really good and I wanted to be able to find it and share it with all of you. So hopping right into it, preface, in the author's classes on systematic theology, three of them total, this book is the first thing students read in systematic theology 
One, Dr. Gore's goal with this book is to take the first thing, the foundational things he teaches at the beginning of his Systematic Theology 1 class and share it with all of us in print. He teaches Systematic Theology over three classes. So you have Systematic Theology 1, 2, 3. This is the foundational stuff covered at the very beginning of Systematic Theology 1 for him. The book's audience and scope. This book is not the last word on anything, but for many students and laymen, it may be the first word they will read about Systematic Theology. That is his audience and scope. He's writing for students and lay people who want to get into Systematic Theology, know the history, of how doing systematic theology has come about and prep them with the tools to do a lifetime of study. As someone from a confessionally Baptist background, I really loved this book too. I've already graduated from seminary and it was really refreshing to read this book about those foundational things that yes, I've read some of these terms in Baptist systematic theologies in other systematic theologies and the very beginning sections where they talk about the discipline, but this really pulled it out with the history stuff and just made it super uh, easy to digest. And so I'm thankful for the work he's done for this book. So it's primarily for students and laymen, but it applies to way more people than just that. Uh, the book's role is to help the student get started or in getting started and move in the right direction and begin a journey that will last a lifetime. He moves into acknowledgments, um, that his stance is within the Reformed tradition. Um, he's in the Presbyterian denomination, um, has served uh, many years as uh, army chaplain. Um, you can see my other video on the short review for more about him or go to the publisher's website. Um, he also talks about the author's hope. His hope is that this introductory work is provided in hopes that it will bless the student, even as I have been blessed by many fathers and the faith. And then we get to chapter one, which is the Encyc Theological Encyclopedia. So this is tons of definitions, really stuff here. Starts out talking systematic theology is an organized discourse about God. He says, first, we got to define what the discipline is. So he says that later on page one, he goes through theology, theos, God, logos, a discourse or study about, and then systematic from a Greek word with a meaning to comprehend, to put together, or to organize. He says systematic theology and other disciplines. So how does this fit with other disciplines of theology? And so he uses the theological encyclopedia found from classic seminary curriculum like Old Princeton from its founding in 1812 until its reorganization. So he says these are the classical theological encyclopedia for doing theology. So he starts out with apologetics or uh, apologetical the theology type of thing. He says the key question about apologetics is how can we know Christianity is right? For those of you who know on the other side of this screen, apologetics is not apologizing for the Christian faith. It's making a defense and arguing for the Christian faith. And so how can we know Christianity is right? Is there's a study starting there? There's exegetical theology. So key question, what does the text actual say? And that involves subdisciplines of canonics, of textual criticism, biblical languages studies, uh, biblical history and archaeology, hermeneutics, how we study and interpret the Bible. You got exegetic, uh, exegesis, proper, and then he has those definitions on page five for all of those for you guys. And then he goes into biblical theology is another one in this encyclopedia. Key question, what does the Bible actually say? He says, all theology should be faithful to what the Bible says. But biblical theology has a particular kind of methodology. It is not theology organized according to a system. We're going to get to systematic, but it's organized based on what the actual biblical authors said. And you can see my longer description of what he's going after there. Then we move into systematic theology. Key question is, what is true? So we want to ask across the whole scope of scripture, what is true about sin? What is true about the Holy Spirit? What is true about Christ? And apply it directly to our day from the whole council of God. So systematic theology, there's a key question. Historical theology, the key question is, what has the church believed about a particular truth and why? So subdisciplines under historical theology uh, would be church history and the history of doctrine. And he goes to the definitions on page eight. Practical theology is the final one. The key theology or key question, how does the church live out its belief? Subdisciplines for this would be pastoral care and counseling, Christian education, homiletics, that's preaching 
and liturgics, that structuring of the worship service, evangelism and missions, church administration. And he goes through definition of each of those on page 10 and 11. He ends this section with the student of all of theology who masters a course of study and approximates the traditional theological encyclopedia will receive a well-rounded preparation for the work of the ministry. The goal in this encyclopedia and these disciplines was to give those preparing for a lifetime of ministry the proper tools they would need to do ministry well, biblically and faithfully. And so those are the disciplines, and he shares that in chapter one. Moving on, chapter two, he talks about the values and limitations of systematic theology. So there's cool values of systematic theology, of putting this framework system together, but then there's also some limitations. And so he goes into this chapter on what those are. So values, we have um, that we as people think systematically. We think about facts and things linked to other facts and other true things, and we group them naturally together. And so systematic theology is is as a value in that it does that and it arranges the facts for us and helps us do that. It helps us hold b- before us the full penelope or the whole counsel of God's truth. It provides provides constructs and outlines that we need to summarize our findings. And number four, it leads to accuracy and the precision in conversations, teaching, preaching, and counseling. It helps us know and defend the system of truth of scripture best. And so it helps us provide a consistent Christian worldview and life view. So that's number five. So what are some of the limitations? It says, for the reformed believer, we must start with the priest supposition that all that guides all theological enterprise that we are finite and not capable of the infinite therefore theology deals with mystery at every point because we will never comprehend god fully though we may apprehend him as he has revealed himself in his word so that's a paraphrase of his section on page 17 through 18 so why do it if god is mysterious if there's mystery to him and we're finite and we can't comprehend who he is Why enter into this enterprise of doing systematic theology? He says, because it is a worthy enterprise and a position of necessity and best answers than any other even more contradictory position. So we enter into this study, even though it has some mystery, because it's valuable because it's based on truth and what God has revealed has truth. And it's better than any other answer that we have. And so he quotes Van Til on page 18 to talk about that. But it is limited, or there are limitations to it, to what we can know, because it accounts and includes God and some mystery that he has not fully revealed. So there are necessary mysteries. So the Trinity, God's sovereignty, and man's responsibility. So these are by A.H. Strong, you see there on the notes. Number two, there are accidental mysteries like insufficient facts, not lacking what is necessary. He talks about those and what those would be in this section, the inadequacy of language due to inherent limitations. So we talk about you can't really say the word eternity and fully explain that idea to someone where they can grasp it. There's limitations on our languages. He also talks about substance uh, around uh, the Lord's Supper or communion, depending on what you want to call it there. And he talks about other instances where language limits us. And so that's number three. He talks about other limitation would be our incomplete knowledge of scripture, that we don't know all parts of scripture equally well. Sometimes we're talking about a system or a topic and we could have missed a cross reference. And so uh, sometimes we don't have full knowledge there. Five, uh, the problem of silence of revelation. There's much God has seen fit not to reveal to us. And so we know that that is the case. So we're only basing with what God has revealed to us. And then six, the problem of the lack of spiritual discernment. Sin can affect us in a way that our understanding of scripture is skewed. And you see my notes there as well. And so he shares all those things. So there's positives, great positives for doing systematic theology, but also some limitations that we have to be honest about as uh, reformed theologians as we go through, as he's talking about here. Chapter three, the task of systematic theology. In order to address the task of systematic theology, a number of subsidiary issues must be addressed. So we can't just launch straight into the topic. We have to talk about some of these other pieces and subject matter and things that are included in it as well. So the subject matter of systematic theology, is it God or experience of the believer? So subject, object, and bridge. 
So do we base our study on what we know of God? Do we base our study on what we experience of God? Because everything's relational and comes through a filter at some point. Or is there some type of a bridge between both of them? He says, conclusion after sharing key perspectives, which he does in the book, the proper subject for systematic theology is God in his nature and in his uh, relations to his creatures. So the proper study is God, but he's always experienced and studied through a relationship because he's communicated to us and we have responded and experienced him. So proper context there. Um, And that comes from Warfield, page 27. Thus, we as God's creatures do theology, but we do so in light of God's revelation to us. So God is not an object that can be studied independently. We study him based on what he has revealed to us. And it's in this context of relationship. So the subject matter is God as he has revealed himself to us. So that gets into how has God revealed himself to us? So sources of revelation, where do we go to obtain this information about who God is, what he does in the world, and what he has shared with us? He goes through that Roman Catholics affirm one source um, called tradition, but then they split. They say there's one source of revelation called tradition, but then they split it into two kinds. Traditional, one scripture is one revelation or source of revelation for them. The other is unwritten oral tradition uh, of the church. So you can see my notes there. And then he goes into Protestants have preferred to embrace the concept of multiple sources. So then he goes through different ones. So Anglican scripture is the supreme authority. And then they also sometimes give credit to reason and tradition, Methodism and Wesleyan scripture, supreme authority, reason, um, tradition, and then they add experience as well as an authoritative source. Um, and then Warfield, it's the Presbyterian, comes along and says there's nature, so natural revelation, um, providence, experience, all three correspond to categories of the general revelation. So general revelation, general revelation or natural revelation, he glump, groups all those together for us as we would see them. And then scripture, he also presents the views from Blasich. And Spikeman, I know I'm probably saying that wrong, please forgive me. And then the conclusion is, God reveals himself through many means, all of which contribute to our knowledge of God. However, we must distinguish between scripture as the unique source of revelation, the fawn euconium, and other sources as subordinate to scripture. So the end thing there is God has revealed himself through scripture and through nature. But everything that we see and experience is su- is subjugated to Scripture and how he has revealed himself in the Scriptures. So the action of systematic theology is not imposing an external system on Scripture, but instead is recognizing the fabric of revealed truth that already exists in the Sacred Scriptures, page 33. This is very important. So systematic theology is not imposing something on Scripture. It's trying to place itself under the authority of Scripture, take what Scripture says, and then sort it into different systems and different relevant fact buckets is kind of what systematic theology is doing. So this action presupposed certain immutable and unquestionable facts. So when it does that, when we systematic theology is under Scripture, sorting into the different categories, it's assuming some different facts. So first, there's unity in the Scriptures by virtue of their ultimate divine author being God. So we're saying that the Scriptures are all related to one another and should be counted as a whole counsel of God. We're also saying there is integrity in the Scriptures and that it represents the truth God intended us to know, that God has preserved his word for us, it was intended for us to know, and then we can base our system of theology on that as we pull from that authoritative source. Also that there is a coherence to the Scriptures, it presents a seamless fabric of redemptive truth, that this Scriptures given by one divine author create one connected story, the storyline of redemption. And so there's a coherence so we can base our system on the whole of scripture, not just different pockets or different sections. So is there biblical warrant for doing systematic theology? This is kind of the question we should arrive at now that we know what the system is, we know what it's trying to do. Is there even warrant for this? Or could we cut this discipline out of the theological encyclopedia, as it were? And so the, there is biblical warrant. Yes, there is. The Bible's pervasive use of fulfillment language tells us that there's ways of doing systems and thought. So you think about Matthew in the gospel connects and says, this is done, Jesus did this to fulfill what was written blank. He's 
cross-referencing. He's pulling something from God's word over here and he's saying it happened because of this. And so he's connecting those. So he's forming a system for us. And so we're picking up some of our cues in that way. Um, the analogy of scripture, understanding of one part tied to understanding of another. There are concepts that Paul uses in the letters and other people use different places that build on previous concepts. And so there's a system and they're, re they're linking those things thought-wise for us and conceptually-wise for us. They're saying, you, if you understand this, then you can understand this. And so that's using a system. Uh, final, there's a caution. It must be emphasized that doing theology does not produce new truth. This is very important. He spends a lot of time clarifying this for us. Very important. He says, rather, it re reproduces the truth. It may bring new truth to light. He talks about an example would be Martin Luther's rediscovery of justification by grace through faith in the Reformation, but it does not generate new truths. So he says that on page 35. So it's key when we're going through systematic theology is systematic theology does not produce new truth, but it does mine the truth of scripture and reproduce slash share it in a special way. So you have Martin Luther and who they, he through the church and the Reformation era lost this teaching on justification by faith alone, and then he shares it from Scripture. It says we're not sharing new truth, but we're discovering and presenting truth from God's word. It may seem new to us, but it's timeless old truth from God's word. So finally, moving into the end part of the section, he talks about doing theology and culture. What is this relationship between culture and doing theology or this discourse speaking about God? He says, one fact is beyond dispute. There is a chronological development of theology, which is the lesson of historical theology. He says, we are all products of our culture and we all do um, theology from our cultural setting and we need to acknowledge that and so page 35 he talks starts talking about that john stott reminds us there are two horizons that must be addressed if we are to do theology properly we must brace and understand the ancient world so we must embrace understand the world of the bible the ancient world their culture how they said things if we're to understand the meaning of what the bible says and we must understand our modern world, so our way of perceiving, seeing things, and our culture. The unavoidable fact is that we hear the divine conversation only after it has passed through several filters, and Dr. Gore talks about these filters for us. And we don't even, they're almost cultural blind spots for us. We don't always think about these, but it's personal and family characteristics, national and regional cultural influences, racial heritage, social relationships, educational matrix, one's personal faith experience, vocation and leisure time matrix, and extent of one's cross-cultural experiences. He does a great job of talking about these in the book right here. Totally get it. Worth everyone. He explains what they are and how they slant somewhat our view and our experience. That's our read of scripture, but also its application and meaning for our life. We end at two key affirmations to end the chapter. He says, there is a transcultural aspect to doing theology. So he quotes Machen that we are moving into a different culture and we need to understand that. We're trying to get meaning from that culture into our culture. And there is an unavoidable cultural influence in doing theology and consequently a need to evaluate critically its effect on the theological task. So we're moving into a culture and pulling out meaning, but we're also pulling that meaning into our culture. So we need to know about both and understand the dynamics there. On page 43 ends the chapter, each of us must recognize the cultural influence that affect our ability to interpret scripture and to do theology. There is no such thing as cultural neutrality. So page 43, as he ends the chapter right there on just encouraging us towards understanding how our culture affects the way we see the Bible and how the culture in which the Bible was written affects its meaning as well. From that point, we move into chapter four, which what is systematic theology? This is where the book really takes off. And most of us picked up the book for this reason specifically right here. So systematic theology as a science. So scientific study is the God-given impulse to seek knowledge, to exercise dominion over the realm of nature, page 45. 
Two types of knowledge based on creation slash creature distinction, archetypal knowledge, transcendent, comprehensive. God ha alone really has this knowledge. So God alone has this knowledge, just to be clear there. Ectypal knowledge, mediated partial knowledge, creatures have, humans have this type of knowledge. So it's finally God has revealed some things that can be investigated and we know them as truth, even though our complete full knowledge is partial. So he starts out this chapter, I'm going to pre preface it here, abbreviate it, and then we're going to get into the study a bit more. But is systematic theology a science? Uh, can we know all, everything about it? And he's going to share that for the Christian, we would say yes. Um, because it's okay that God is mysterious and we're starting with something that's not totally nailed down. Uh, people who are unsaved and unregenerate are going to say no. And so that's why he's getting into science at the very beginning of this, talking about is this a scientific study? Is this something we can track down and know for certain? He moves into, you see it right there on the screen, the antithesis. The word slash concept is introduced. He introduces it in the book to show the scientific pursuits done by the children of God, the regenerate, and the children of darkness, the unregenerate slash unsaved, will go against each other in any theological enterprise, and this will permeate every issue that arises in creation. So page 47, and that's my section summary right there. So he says, The regenerate will think with new hearts and minds. The investigation of God is part of the creation mandate. We will include that as part of the creation mandate. We are supposed to do this, and that we are to fully engage in theology as a science. The children of darkness, those who are not saved, they believe there is no God to whom they are accountable and they will rule out theology as a science because of their autonomous definition of science. They say you can't include in science what is knowable, repeatable, to be done over time, a God who's mysterious that we can't know, a transcendent being who has knowledge beyond us that we can't know about. So you can't include this in science. So the role of reason comes into this is also disputed between the two, the regenerate and the children of darkness, as he states it. Any scientific investigation employs reason, but for the regenerate, reason must be subject to scripture. So for those who are saved, for the Christian, for those who are um, following God, that our reason is subject to scripture. So if scripture says something, that's the authority. But it is, um, our knowledge is, uh, there is subject to scripture. It is the assumption of the Christian faith that there are truths concerning God that transcend our reason and our senses. So he says that on page 50. One implication of this, that or the paradox of antinomy, as it's said there on the screen, is ultimately unavoidable for the Christian thinker. Our knowledge is true, but it is only partial. God, on the contrary, has a knowledge that is complete and full. Thus, the finite is incapable of the infinite. So the Christian thinker will always have some mystery in their methodology because they consider God's existence as true. So he's saying this is where we kind of divide with those who are unsaved because we believe God is true, but we don't fully know everything about him because he's somewhat a mystery. We're going to place ourselves reason under scripture, whereas those who are unregenerate and unsafe said only that which we can prove is true, um, that scripture has to be subject to my reason and thinking. Um, to speak of theology as a science is also to acknowledge a number of different but related ideas, that theology is a practical science. So as he continues through this chapter, it's more than ontology, more than existence. So theology is not just about proving that which exists, but you see there has teleology, it has purpose and direction. So we say, God, this discipline has some effects on the way we actually live and do life. So it is adapted to, related to, and connected to life, you see there. We may helpfully define theology as the application of God's word by persons to all areas of life. So page 53, and that's him quoting from John Frame. He moves on further into other relationships. So we've already talked about what is systematic theology. And we've talked about um, this kind of relationship between the regenerate and the unregenerate. And then he gets into this the uh, relationship between theology and philosophy. So they cover much about this on page 53 through 57. Some of the overview of philosophy deals more with general knowledge about reality. I have the full section there. It's trying to put together a system and framework that makes sense of all of life. 
So every different perspective, every different viewpoint is kind of what theology is doing. You have epistemology, axology, ontology, ethics. It's right there on the notes if you want to pause it and read it from page 54. And then he moves into theology is concerned with reality, but from a narrower perspective of what God has revealed. It does not seek to range over the entirety of the created order, but seeks to understand more fully the revealed word as contained in both the general and special revelation to say that they are not related but the evidence says otherwise some would say hey these things are not related but scripture uh, the evidence would say otherwise we're talking here about uh, theology and philosophy some would like to divide them as disciplines and said that they don't even cross over are not related at all but the evidence is clearly against it that they do go together when we're speaking about the discourse about god and he's tied to everything that's come into being, philosophy is going to cross over into that discipline as well. The most fitting promulgamina to theology is, and so he puts forward, Christian philosophy. So we don't do theology based on non-Christian presuppositions. So he says philosophy is going to come with non-Christian, or non-Christian philosophy is going to come with non-Christian presuppositions. And he's like, we need to do Christian philosophy. The key is to recognize the difference between Christian philosophy, which presupposes the truth of revelation, so scripture, and non-Christian philosophy, which presupposes the truth of some other axiom or first principle. So some other autonomy. Um, So that's there. Then we move into doing theology, typologies. Um, This is... How do we go about knowing scripture? How do we go about studying it? So typology focuses on the structure, the systems of thought. For purposes, typology identifies methodology, page 58. This is kind of boring, but stick with me here. I think you're going to get this. It says at the end of this chapter, um, so this next quote is at the end of the chapter, but I put it here so you can understand this concept because it was kind of confusing as you're reading through, but the payoff doesn't come till the end. So here's the payoff at the end of the chapter. He says, um, Fundamentally, the issue is one of the starting point. So when we're talking about typologies, where should we start in doing systematic theologies? Do we begin with the culture or some point of human experience? Or do we begin with something more objective? So the Reformed tradition is generally in agreement that the starting point must be objective, namely the word of God. So do we start with just our culture and our experience? This is what God is because of the way I experience him, or do we start with something objective and true? And so you see there the comments 64 through 65. Um, That's at the end of the chapter. And so before he gets there, he goes through all of these typologies or ways of doing it. So um, George Lindbeck, you see right there, claims three types of ways of doing theology. I'm just going to state the titles. If you want to read more about those, pause the video and you can read each one. My brief statements about each one there. So George Lindbeck talks about cogni- uh, cognitive pre- uh, propositionalist or known as the traditional way, the experiential expressive or the expressively symbolic way, and then a hybrid. And so you have their fixed truth, kind of the objective or based on experience or a bridge between the two, we would hold to the first one. Peter Toon talks about four types and adds a fourth type of doing theology um, to Peter Berger's three types. So he talks about the deductive approach. This method uses scripture and or the tradition of the church to deduce objective truth falls under the category. You have Christ transforming culture. So this is something I was really glad that Dr. Gore brought into this book as he starts paralleling them with some things that you might have heard that you might already know about. So then he talks into the inductive approach. Um, You can see the definition there and read about it. The reductive approach, the definition there and read about it. And then the regulative approach as well. Then he goes into Donald Blosich, um, claims there are four types or options for doing theology. Um, He, this is really cool, Dr. Gore adds a list. So um, Dr. or uh, Donald Blosich, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but you get what I'm saying. It's right there on the screen for you guys. Um, He gives these four categories and then he shares theologians who would go in those categories. And so that section of this book was really helpful. And then he also correlates it, Dr. Gore does, to some of the previous sections and typologies and sayings. It shares 
common things with this. So we have a theology of restoration. You see there a list of some of the theologians who land in that part. A, theologi a theology of accommodation, a theology of correlation, and then a theology of confrontation. And so the goal of this, and you see these, um, we kind of land, uh, Reformed theologians land mostly in theology of restoration, um, that we need to return to the pre-modern view of theology and the world. And so when you do that, you're landing with Warfield, Hodge, Gerstner, Sproul, and others that he lists in the book. And then there's also this kind of bridge that some of us land in this other category, a theology of confrontation. Um, the goal of this militant theology is conversion of the culture and philosophy to the new values and the transcendent perspectives of the kingdom of God. So you have Calvin, Barth, Kuyper, Bruner, Bonhoeffer, and others. So it has similarities to Christ transforming culture. So how do we go about doing theology? There's a bunch of different typologies and approach. Return up there to that section from 64-65. The question is, where do we start? And so the Reformed systematic theologian is in agreement that the starting point must be objective, namely the word of God. And so that's how we approach doing systematic theology. Number five, chapter five, finally moving into a covenant model. This is where the proposed version of doing system or systematic theology comes up in this book by Dr. Gore right here. He says this chapter looks at how two prominent Reformed theologians, Hodge, and Van Til have attempted to do theology and then will be followed by a proposed model for doing reformed systematic theology on page 65. So Charles Hodge wrote this book on systematic theology, taught at Princeton Theological Seminary, says there are three ways of learning, the speculative method, which employs axiom and deductions, mystical method, which relies on feelings or emotions, and then the inductive method, which Hodge argues is the only proper way for doing theology. In this method, facts are gathered, a hypothesis is offered, and the hypothesis is confirmed. So important characteristics of Hodge's model. I'm sharing my brief summary of these. Get the book for more in-depth stuff. This was a rich section, really loved it. He talks about how Hodge attempted to avoid subjectivism. He talks about some have changed that his reliance on Scottish common sense realism undermined the Calvinistic notion of no noetic depravity. So there's some critiques here of Hodge's perspective. Hodge's emphasis on the importance of scripture and his continual reference to scripture as are commendable. This use of this inductive method, however, obscures the covenantal development of Scripture. So this is Dr. Gore's critique of Hodge's method. Um, just briefly, he says, like, Hodge has some good things right, but he also has some things that could be adapted, equated, and corrected a bit. So a summary of what we should learn and take from Hodge is dropped by Dr. Gore on page 70. Then he moves into Cornelius Van Til. Van Til sought to establish a theological method that made dependence on revelation to be its starting point. So Van Til argues that it is the revealed word of God that is the foundation of any possible knowledge. Since we do not bring with reason, uh, since we do not bring with reason or any other point in the creation horizon, um, probably saying that wrong, but there's the quote there. We must affirm that our starting point lies in the affirmation, Deus Dexit, God has spoken. Van Til is passionate about the fact that we, if we don't hold as a part of our theology that God has spoken and God has revealed revelation, then we've lost it. Um, he's like, we can't even relate to other disciplines with other people who are doing scientists and other things if we can't get this right because they're basing things off on lies and if we don't get this right then we're not basing ourselves off the truth and we've departed those christian things so van Til begins with the affirmation that apart from the god of the bible and his revelation no single fact in this universe can be known truly by man page 74 so van Til would say if you don't have a system of thought that starts with the fact that God exists and he has spoken through his word, you can't know anything truly. That's where Van Til lands. So that's his presuppositional apologetics method coming out. So then Dr. Gore goes into this proposed model. I've done my best to summarize those two things. He does a way better job in this book. So definitely pick it up if you're interested in these things. He moves to a proposed model for doing reformed systematic 
theology in agreements with the starting point of Van Til. So we presupposed God and his revelation of scripture and that it's true and an appreciation for the strengths and weaknesses of Charles Hodge, the author offers, or Dr. Gore offers, a proposed covenantal model for doing reformed systematic theology. And so you see this list in front of you. I'm going to go through it briefly. I can't explain all of it. Get the book for more of this. But he talks about we start with a presupposition of God, of the God of the Bible. So we begin by presupposing the God of the Bible. This belief in God is axiomatic and presuppositional. So it's the, the starting point by which we order all the other truth. That's the axiomatic part, but is also presuppositional that it's our pres- we presuppose this is true without trying to f- confirm it by reason because it is shrouded a bit in mystery. So it's a presupposition that we start with. Then he moves into the experience of God is a part of it. So this presupposition of God reminds us that we have experienced the grace of God. There is an element in truth in those systems of theology that include experience for we do know him and he has made it known to us and we have experienced it. Then he moves into reason is subordinate or subordinate or under scripture and that we trust his revelation. You see more comments there. The content or context of covenant in the historical context. So this is a big part of Reformed theology. From Genesis to Revelation, there is a story of redemption that gradually unfolds in the context of a covenanted people. So that should be part of the systematic method. Historical grammatical exegesis. We should be studying as a part of this method. What does the text say? What did it mean to the original audience? And how should we apply the text in today? culture, biblical theological constructs that from this point other scriptures are consulted and developed to arrive at the end product that is fully developed. This is or is very closely related to biblical theology and would include intertextuality, the coming kingdoms, etc. So this step in the system. And then we get to a system of theology. The results of this biblical theological construct result in the foundation for systematic theology development and formalization. Formulation. Such a system will incorporate all the previous developed insights offered by biblical theology. So the biblical study is done, and then that's grouped into those silos or those systems of thought. Within that system, the Reformed systematic theologian theologian does all this in light of the dynamics of a covenant relationship and in light of the principle of Catholicity. So they will seek to interpret scripture in light of theology of the church as expressed in the creeds and the early church confession documents of the Reformation and the post-Reformation Era. So there's a point of we're dealing with scripture as the supreme authority. Then once that system of theology is together, we correlate that with um, the covenant relationship aspect and also the Catholicity of what the church has believed timeless across all ages. So think early creeds and confessional documents. So then there's historical reflection that's done. The still tentative results of systematic theology at this stage must yet undergo an examination through the lens of historical church reflection. And then the final thing is that that system of theology is together and then it moves to practical application or practical theology. At the end of the process, the question must be asked, how does this truth relate to all other truth and how can the church live that truth today? He says, in other words, how we apply God's truth to the concrete situations of covenantal living in a way that is honoring and glorifying to God. And he says, this is what makes systematic theology unique because it's trying to be faithful to what the Bible says and yet place it in categories that we ask real questions of today and want real answers. And so it's trying to serve us well by telling us what the Bible says by going through a system, but then we can ask about a certain area of theology and get a practical answer. So the proposed model contrasted with the old Princeton model. So that's his proposed model from the book. He then contrasts that with the old Princeton model. Um, But he first critiques Hodge's model in some different ways um, using the work of J.I. Packer, who's an Anglican, um, that there are some ways that old Princeton's model needs to be augmented. So one thing that Princeton or the Princeton theologians were clear about is they wanted to be faithful to the faith of the past. And they said, we didn't really change or have a Princeton theology. And uh, Dr. Gore, as well as J.I. Packer, and some of the people he quotes are going to say they did in certain ways. And so Westminster Theological Seminary and some others um, have adjusted and improved 
their way of doing theology. So that comes through some of these augmented or critiques. So uh, Packer shows that Hodge needed to rehabilitate the notion of mystery. We may apprehend God, but we will never comprehend him. Some will be left in mystery. And so Hodge tried to know everything he could. He's like, we need to know that some will remain in mystery. Moving on, he says, Princeton has a tendency to ignore the analogical nature of language. So our language must always be viewed analogically. It moves on to this creator and creature distinction. So those that are finite, us, and God who is infinite. So we need some to know that in our language, there are those distinct categories. The inductive theology enterprise, he says, really needs to be replaced by a more fruit for the more fruitful results of biblical theology spearheaded by Gihardus Voss and others in the Presbyterian faith. So he talks about how that inductive method really gets replaced by a better method in biblical theology. And this is systematic theology must be tied to its application. And so Hodge was really focused on knowing what we can know but left some of the practical aspects off. And so that was a critique that Packer gives as well. So summary, Old Princeton made a number of innovations, even though they would claim they didn't, they did. And those lessons are important ones, um, but they could be critiqued, augmented. They were by Westminster Theological Seminary. And so that's where he's presenting and he's kind of pulling all that together in a method for doing systematic theology that is not new, but has been adjusted and refined. So he says, last summary of this multi-perspective nature of a covenantal model for doing systematic theology. So last summary of it comes page 86 through 87. 87. He says, the reformed systematic theologian, if he will be faithful to the task at hand, he must be aware of the world in which he lives, especially the surrounding culture and the issues that culture raises. So he's going to go through these things saying, if you're a reformed systematic theologian, here's the summary of what you need to be aware of the culture. You must be faithful to the task, aware of the culture that you're studying, but also the culture that you're living in. He says the reformed systematic theologian on point two must do theology from the standpoint of his personal faith as one who has experienced the grace of God and desires to know, grow more f- effectively in the grace by knowing God better. And then number three, the most importantly, the Reformed systematic theologian must do theology in light of the revelation of God in his word. So considering culture, both it, the Bible's culture and our culture, then also understanding that you're saved and want to grow in grace. And then third, that you're placing yourself under God's word. He says, in conclusion, the task of reform, reformation is only successful when each generation is willing to examine afresh its commitment to the teachings of the Reformed faith in light of the word of God, and then apply them to the issues of the day, page 87. This is a difficult task, but is the, it is the most fruitful one. And that's where he ends the book and then moves into the appendix A and B. You can see the contents there on your screen. So for those who made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you. I want to thank the Greater Heritage Christian Publishing, Dr. Gore, for writing this, been publishing this. Um, I really enjoyed the read. I hope that this video has encouraged you to study systematic theology. Uh, get this book, dive into it, have it on your shelf as a future resource. If you have other resources you have loved, enjoyed about system or from systematic theology, I would love to hear about them. I've read um, Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. I've read Grudem's Systematic Theology. I enjoy theology. I enjoy historical theology. I enjoy biblical theology. I love the way that it helps us engage the Bible in different ways. Um, all of those disciplines underneath scripture. And so I'd encourage those who are curious and want to study more, get this book, keep it on the shelf, and continue this lifelong study. I like where Dr. Gore ends this because he's trying to train students and laymen to understand the history and the formation of doing theology, this discourse, this discussion about God in the past, so that they can be faithful in not only speaking and living for God in the presence, but also that they might live for him and teach others what it means to be faithful and to follow him. And so systematic theology is a great tool um, I believe God has given us and others have stewarded and shaped so that we might know what God says and we might apply it and live it in our lives. So with that, pick up this up wherever great books are show, sold. If you have questions, comments, favorite book recommendations, we'd love to hear them in the comments. 
other links I mentioned previously in the comments as well. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. Until next time, continue to read, treasure, follow the word. God bless, and I'll see you guys soon.